All right, are we underway? We are underway. Excellent. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Do you want to just fast forward one screen and everyone can see that hashtag? Um, double click. Excellent. Um, so th there's the hashtag if you want to use it uh, to talk. Otherwise, um, oh, we're, 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 we're learning our way around the technology, so thank you. Um, we are a technology company, right? Um, so um, uh, let's just fast forward again uh, to the next one. I'm, I'm Jamie here. Hi, this is Ashley. I'm a content and social media strategist here at 3Spot. Um, and I'm Nithya Chambers. I am a lead, three spots lead content strategist. All right. Before you guys get any further, uh, I can testify you guys all look like this. I'll take a picture. <laughs> in fact, I think I put one on Twitter. But do you want to explain to people what they're looking at here? Because I'm apparently the last one to this party. Bitmojis? Bitmojis. Bitmojis took over three spot. Uh, about this is your content strategy, <laughs> Bitmojis. <laughs> 18 months ago, I think, when um, Nithya gave a, a groundbreaking presentation uh, about her relationship with work that was in entirely in these bitmojis. Um, do you want to tell them what these are? Well, yeah. Th so they're like um, they're they're sort of expressions of self, as you can see, um, and uh, they update them pretty frequently. And you can use them in text messages to communicate back and forth as images. And um, this is just a small sampling of um, of what's there in terms of reactions. Think of them as you know emojis, but personalized. Um, you know, a Game of Thrones is there, Silicon Valley, Inside Out. They do a lot of, I mean, their content strategy is pretty amazing, so it's definitely worth downloading and building your own. My mom has one now. She sends it sometimes when she's upset. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's definitely um, a lot of fun to be had there, and, um, and, and we like to use them cause, because they're awesome. Because. Why not? Because. <laughs> um, let's jump ahead. Um, so this is, this is, we're three spot. Um, we're a strategic uh, creative agency helping social good organizations do social good gooder. Um, <laughs> so uh, next slide. Our, our clients break down across um, a few different lines. We, we work with foundations and nonprofits and certain pieces of the government. Um, and then we, we work with some commercial clients, but very, very, very rarely, um, I think 99% is non-commercial clients. You guys are a B Corp now, right? Yeah, we became a B Corp this year. If anybody's considering becoming a B Corp, feel free to reach out. It is a long process, and I, I, I'm glad it is. I feel like uh, my father's a Marine, and when he got his conceal and carry gun license, I, we don't agree on guns, my dad and I, uh, when he got it, he took the test, even though he didn't have to, and he was like, my God, I'm glad the test was hard. Like, and so that's how I feel about B Corp. I'm, my God, I'm glad the test was hard. So that's that. So this is Ashley again, and just to give you a little bit of an agenda of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, we're really going to focus on the things that you can learn by observing your, your landscape and the kinds of questions that you should be asking yourself to figure out if those things that you're seeing in the landscape actually align with your organization's content strategy. So to do that, we're going to show you a couple of our favorite examples, and then we're also going to offer some points for discussion uh, for yourself or for your organization. So I think the question that if you're in this webinar that you're going to have is you're wondering why we're making such a big deal about content strategy. And the reason is because survival. Um, having a good name or an established brand, it's, it's not enough anymore to make you matter to people. Uh, your users want to know how they can be connected to your work. They want to understand how you're making good on your promises of impact. And they want to have all of that information on their own terms, whether that's in Facebook or email or during the commercials of their favorite TV show. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about today and uh, really thinking about how to prepare your, you and your organization for stories that matter. So if you came today for Three Spots definition of content strategy, this is it. Um, it's, re it's really about thinking about what your organization's story is expressed in tangible, uh, consumable forms. And I think in this, in thinking about your mission and your work and your impact, we really can't stress goals and audiences enough. Um, it really helps evaluate a landscape of endless, endless possibilities for storytelling um, into what's going to work for you based on what you need it to do. So I think you know, it, it, goals and audiences are certainly implied in thinking about your mission and your work and your impact um, and the people that you're trying to reach, but I think 
um, it's not it's something that I think we go to over and over again um, in evaluating the work that we do um, and and in and in thinking about new ways to do it. Um, and I think you know another way of thinking about it is thinking about the structure and the substance and the style of the stories that you're telling, of every story that you tell. And here at Three Spot, um, we think that it's never too early to start talking about process and production, what's required, breaking apart the stories that you're trying to tell into assets and understanding your responsibility in bringing those assets and time over timeline together um, to tell the best possible stories. So I think, you know, one thing that we, we also think is really important um, is, is, is looking to the landscape of content strategists and, and, and pulling from, uh, from different definitions to understand what's going to best suit you and best suit your organization. We find that different voices, um, different definitions, different emphasis in content strategy because it is, I think, you know, the reason people like to talk about it so much right now is because it's a little bit squishy. Um, and I think um, looking for different voices and definitions helps you start to evaluate what matters to your organization um, and, and, and what lens of content strategy you, need to, you want to put on it when you're, when you're talking about it and thinking about it and thinking how it's going to impact the way you communicate. Um, Christina Halverson is probably one of content strategy's um, most recognizable vo voices and, and the CONFAB conference and I think some of the spin-off conferences are just a great um, resource if you're looking for an, an in-person uh, intense content strategy experience. I think you know, her definition um, definitely focuses a lot on, on the planning of content. Um, we brought, we've also brought in um, Rachel Loving, Lovinger, it might be Rachel Lovinger. Um, she talks about the balance of, need, of organizational needs in defining content strategy and, and, and really I think the role of, of content strategy in, in bringing your work to life. Um, and finally, another voice we brought in here is Erin Kassane. These are all, you know, authors and, and very prolific content strategists if you, if you do any Googling. And I think um, something I really like about her definition is, is that it's about aligning communications around your goals um, in channel appropriate ways. And so um, I think that between these four definitions, you might recognize your organization a little bit better in one of them or, or in pieces of two of them. But, I, but you can also see that they have similarities in thinking about, about planning, about communication, about your organizational needs, and, and also recognizing and evaluating the opportunities that are out there. So um, we'll be making this presentation available after uh, the webinar. So um, just noting those are, those are three people you should be following. If, if content strategy is something that's regularly on your mind, they're going to give you more ammo, more case studies, more examples, more tools, more tricks, all the kinds of things we do. Um, that they're going to certainly help you out. Um, we want to talk a little bit about where today was at for content strategy, and that's another lens for why content strategy is important. Um, the fact of the matter, this, this picture is only slightly different than it was five years ago and probably only slightly differenter than it was five years before that. The fact of the matter is that your, your opportunities for storytelling have always been endless, and they're, they're, we can only just we feel how much more opportunity there is with every passing week, every passing month. You have a new stakeholder within your organization saying, hey, I saw this thing the New York Times did with Google, uh, Google Cardboard. Should we be doing that? Or you have this other person saying, hey, I saw, I saw this great thing on Snapchat. Is that right for our organization? And five years ago, it was like, oh, have you heard of Second Life? And, you know, so like it's, it's, I, I was in that conversation. That was said to me. Um, it, but this, this will continue to be the case. And, you know, Nithya was talking earlier about goals. Goals are all about helping you as, as often the one-man army or one-person army against that onslaught of questions and can we do, can we do, can we do. Uh, your goals that imbue throughout your content strategies, what's going to help you make those yes and no decisions as, as you look at this huge landscape that's available to all your communications opportunities? And I think one of the things that is going to help, help you make some of those decisions is data. Um, I think that's one of the great things about, um, about this moment in time is that there's like an endless amount of data. So when someone comes to you and says, should we be on Snapchat, um, you, can, you can find out if you're trying to reach a mostly female audience below the age of 35. Um, and what you're asking them to do, um, and if that aligns with, uh, if, if, if Snapchat aligns with what you're asking them to do. So I think, you know, there, there's a lot, there are a lot of great um, resources in helping you make those decisions. Part of them, 
come from you in, in talking about your goals and who you're trying to reach and what you want them to do, but part of it is about um, really digging into the landscape and understanding what different channels and platforms allow you to do, who they allow you to reach, and, and, and using the data to, um, to back up your decision making. Let's pause on this real quickly, because I think this is a real distinction that is worth noting, right, which is that it used to be if you worked in communications, you majored in English, and you wrote pretty nicely, and you put out a press release, and that was the end of it. And increasingly, there's a real rigor and science, and God forbid me for saying this, occasionally some math involved, right? You know, it's the old Chevy Chase line. I was told there would be no math. But, but in fact, it actually is helping us become a little bit more precise and effective. I mean, I think that's how I read this slide is, wow, I now know with real precision who I can and should be talking to. Yeah, um, sorry, like, like I'm going to, here's the spoiler on my Please. first conversation with anybody ever about this stuff. And when people come to us and they're like, I want a contemporary content strategy, I want a contemporary website, the first thing is it's not Twitter or Snapchat. It's like, okay, let's, let's establish a goal. And like we've worked with a lot of people in this space. We understand how hard a question that is. I mean, it's, it's one thing to establish a goal. We're going to end hunger in this country or that country or establish a goal like we're going to get health care for Americans. But like we're talking about like functional goals closer to the ground. It's very hard to do, but that's, that's what drives all this at the end of the day. Like Nithya can only say that about Snapchat and women under 35 because it meant someone in the conversation actually said, we want to reach women under 35. It's hard to say that. I just freestyled, sorry. <laughs> that was good freestyling. You didn't rhyme though. You didn't rhyme. <laughs> That's not my thing. All right. Cool. Um, and so I think, you know, the other thing that, that you'll probably hear from us um, in ways over and over again through this is approaches into content strategy vary too. Um, I think I have a media background and so um, one of the things that I think about a lot is um, the process that's required to, to create things. Um, backing the process into assets and the assets in the process required to get the assets. And then thinking about the timeline and, and the pieces that move that are in place um, in order to accomplish the story that you're trying to tell. And, and I think um, for me the good stuff is never by accident. Um, it, it, it's always well planned and, and well timed and, um, and, and strategically thought out. And so um, I think, you know, that's always the lens that I, I take to kind of backtrack um, content possibility um, is the process that's required to, um, to accomplish it. For me, I, I, always come in at, I always come into the picture from like an angle of resources. I think I'm often building teams within the agency here or within uh, a client situation or in some other more amorphous situation. So for me, I'm always looking at what's the staff required to get it done? What are the resources we need? Maybe, I'm, maybe that's pictures or video or text or whatever. Um, what's the budget if I need more assets or more staff? So I'm always coming at it like that, that's where my whole sustainability angle comes from. It's like looking at like what are the resources needed to make this a reality? And I think for me, a lot of it starts with the audience. I come from a nonprofit space where we don't always have money or resources to do the most razzle-dazzle things. So it's about connecting directly with my audience, finding out what's going to motivate and move them, and really working to gather those resources to move the needle on that engagement. So I think we want to talk a little bit about the landscape. And these are going to come in the form of uh, some case studies of things that we found in this space that were sort of compelling to us. And we spend a lot of time looking at what's out there and what's available and how people are experimenting with platforms and content types to tell different and interesting stories. And the truth is, you should be paying attention too. And so you're going to look at MoMA, you're going to see that they're on Snapchat, and they're doing really fun and cool things. But then it's the moment where you evaluate that against what you know to be true for your organization, and you weigh it against your priorities and your resources, and you decide if this is the right, right approach for you. So even if you admire what someone's doing, and we're going to show these examples of things people have been doing that we really admire, um, it's about making this right size for you and your organization and evaluating where it fits into your content strategy. And I, I think a lot of times we use a lot of these like micro moments in the landscape because you know we walk into a lot of engagements with people that say, you know, in our very early kind of conversation and discovery phase, 
yeah, my, you know, the president of our board forwarded me this, this interactive map and, and says that he wants us to do more things like this. That's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so far. So far. How can we do so far. Um, and I think that, I think what we, when we bring these landscape moments to the table in a lot of our engagements, um, we see them as opportunities to pause and evaluate and brainstorm and critique. It's not necessarily about um, that you should be building the next snowfall, um, but it's about teaching your organization how to evaluate what opportunities are right for you. Can we just, as a point of order here, snowfall I think is known to all of us. My guess is if I asked everybody to raise their hands, most of the crowd would too, but real briefly, snowfall was sort of a groundbreaking piece of multimedia Long form. long form journalism by the uh, the New York Times that focused on a, a horrible disaster at a ski hill uh, outside of Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe it's probably still up online. It was, I think, perhaps the most viewed thing on the Times, maybe for more than one year. Yeah. And when you get asked if you can do that, you can always point out that they had a team of, I think, 75 people. 75 people. That digital team at that time. That's a lot of planning. <laughs> yeah. So like when you're fighting for that one extra resource in communications, you can just say, well, if I have 75 people, you can have snowfall. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Resources are really crucial. And you see that in a, in a, we've had the luxury of rehearsing, so I've seen a little of this, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute, right? If you're, if you're in this webinar, it's because you have a hand on content strategy for your organization. And that, that means there's a moment for you to be the first line of a defense against big ideas and also the biggest cheerleader for small ideas that have potential. So figure out what, the, what your parameters are for, for assessing those moments. So one of the first case studies we want to talk about um, and the lesson behind it is the idea that you need to really empower your people and train them appropriately. So the first case study is um, from a couple weeks ago, actually. I love and this story. It's a, it's a good one. In March, uh, BART, which is San Francisco's train system, suffered a pretty serious technical meltdown, and it closed the, an entire section of tracks. So if you can imagine, their poor social media manager was just fielding complaints and frustrations from, from their riders right and left. And like any good social media manager, he monitored the incoming messages, and they discussed a response plan with their team. Now, while his the other members of his team went to go talk to more traditional news sources about the event, you know, the television and having their media channels and phone numbers set up. Taylor, their, their social media manager, actually swung into action as their digital spokesperson. He paused the automated tweets that were typically pushed out from their Twitter feed, and then for 57 tweets, instead of offering just abject apologies to writers, he actually offered information. Um, he educated users on the causes of the disrepair, and he addressed the reality that their crumbling infrastructure needed funding and attention. It wasn't necessarily a, a political moment of advocacy, but just really providing users with information about why the system was failing and what they could do about it. And just let's pause here. So from a systemic perspective, what's really interesting to me when we were talking about this was, if you live as we do in Washington, the phrase press secretary means something. You're on the record. You're typically somewhere between a wonk and a comms expert, right? And when you say something, you are speaking on behalf of your boss or the organization that you represent. What's extraordinary here is that the folks at BART, their Twitter channel, at least for a little while, became an active voice and they acted like a press secretary. What the, that really means to me is this wasn't being done in an ad hoc manner. It wasn't being done with, without any attention and it was being done by a senior member of the team. And you, Can you explain a little bit about his background because I think that's actually interesting for folks to hear. Sure. This was not the 19-year-old intern doing this. Right. So. Um, Taylor is their social media spokesperson. He manages their feeds. He's a, I believe, 27-year-old. He is very knowledgeable about infrastructure, so this is something that he has institutional knowledge of, and I think he'd had a background in, in some, I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe he had a background in some political work as well. So very aware of the situation, the implications of the situation. And it was just one of those moments where you wouldn't send an intern to address your issues on television. Why would you send an intern to your social media network? Yeah, yeah, excellent. So a couple other things. I think that this is a real moment. You know, this is actually a quote from Taylor uh, in his, Giz, I, I believe, Gizmodo uh, piece that he discussed afterwards. And it's really about, 
removing the risk with social media starts with hiring really talented, really smart, and forward-thinking professionals who know how to handle these situations. And it's also about equipping your team early on to be able to manage and discuss these situations. He knew how to respond. These were actually responses that they had pushed out similarly before. This was not an on-the-fly situation. So I think a couple of questions as you're taking this scenario and applying it to your own work, a couple of questions to ask yourself are, are you getting the most out of your channels? And that starts with, are you hiring people and working with individuals who know the capacity, the range of what a channel can do and are constantly thinking about how to build that social network more effectively for you? Are you empowering those same people to experiment, whether it's with a social network or with the kind of content that they're sharing on that social network? And then finally, are you communicating those successes, those experimental opportunities? Are you com communicating them widely so that people understand the value of that experimentation? And having, having a plan as well is, is equally as valuable in this situation. I think, what's, I, mean, I think what's really interesting when you step back and you look at this story in totality is that he took a local transportation meltdown and turned it into a local and then national conversation on policy and infrastructure. Um, and I think that is that's kind of like an amazing case scenario. Um, but but it, it also speaks to the power of what this can do. He was consistent over a period of time. He didn't you know throw the towel in or start ignoring people. Um, and it was a long dialogue. And you could see, um, you know, there's always a certain amount of, of blah, blah on Twitter, <laughs> um, especially when you're uh, navigating like a live event like that, but I think you could really start to see um, people's, people's understanding of the problem become more nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it just it generated a lot of interesting discussion in what followed about both about infrastructure and, and community, but also about what you can do with a platform like this when you're using it the right way. And I think he was able to diffuse a lot of the anger for the situation and, and really provide perspective on what brought them to that moment. So a couple of, I just wanted to share two more examples. Uh, if you're looking to see how you can really embrace the idea of voice or- We had to throw some Hamilton in there. did. <laughs> I, if, if you want a, a couple of other case studies here to take a look at, I highly recommend that you follow Lynn manuels manual uh, Twitter feed. He has a fantastic voice. You know, it is business. He is really selling tickets to Hamilton. But at the end of the day, I think that he's been able to do something really special and build a community on his Twitter feed. The other one I'd uh, recommend taking a look at is Sonos. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it's a product where it's a, basically a speaker system. We have one here at our office. And occasionally, we'll tweet to the Sonos folks, and they'll tweet back recommendations to us, like have an office dance party. It's just a lot of fun. It's a very responsive Twitter feed, and I, I think they're doing a great job to empower their team to, to make those conversations happen. And Lynn manuel you told me one thing that's really interesting about him is he does it in a very sort of systematic, methodical uh, yeah. way. He has a morning tweet. He has an evening tweet. Yep. It's a great mix of personal, professional. He's wonderfully congratulatory to everyone in the theater space, and I think it makes him a real point of community. Is a goal for all of your CEOs. They all Absolutely. grow up. They may not be able to sing and dance like Lin Manuel, but uh, or rap. But, but I'm uh, sure they have plenty of charisma. <laughs> so I think I think in the like kind of the being more explicit about the application and like what what three thought would do if we were if we were in the room with you would be to talk about who those voices are and what the pattern is for them. You know, taking someone like Lin Manuel, taking taking voices that you respect and admire, that you feel are active in ways, you know, look, you can look, certainly look at any number of the White House feeds to do that. Um, and, and look at a day, look at a week, um, establish the pattern of communication, how often, how often they're posting, things that they're posting about, um, and what that would mean if you were doing it. Who, who the voices would be, would they be authentic? I think people respond to, to Lynn manuel um, they respond to Michelle Obama when she does the, the little MO on her on her tweets because it's authentic and, and, and there's a voice that they're responding to. And so I think you know the takeaway is to is in both of these cases is to 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 apply what that looks like inside your organization with the voices that you're trying to to bring to these spaces um, and and what the pattern would be um, on the subject on the subject matter that's important to you. People not programmed. 
sweet. All right, next up. Um, we talked about this a little bit. We, we, did a, we did a workshop at ComNet back in San Diego. We talked about bottlenecks a little bit, and, and I, I think that's a, that's a big part of, of content strategy is, is just how many roadblocks you will face as your organization evolves, as your opportunities evolve. So let's take a look at an extreme case of identifying a bottleneck and removing it. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, the National Geographic's little Twitter feed, um, but it is not little at all. Um, it's massive, and uh, their follower numbers are incredible. The response to their photos is incredible. Um, I can't wait to see a year or two years from now um, the surveys they'll do and they'll, when they'll start to see that people's first interaction with National Geographic has now been Instagram rather than Bieber. Yeah. Right. Oh, wait, yes. Yes. I mean, for me, the first interaction from Nat Geo was, you know, that, that hologram mm -hmm. skull on the cover that year that was like groundbreaking. Uh, but now, you know, in the next generation, it's going to be Instagram. And, and what they did here, which uh, if, if we've all run publications of one stripe or another, you know, Nat Geo was about sending amazing photographers, so asset one that we're going to leverage. We have the best photographers going and everybody wants them. It used to be they would send them to amazing places and they would take rolls and rolls of film and then an editor would pick one. And that would go in the, that would go in the magazine or they'd pick five or ten or twelve in a spread. Uh, when it came to the Instagram, no longer a magazine, they got rid of the editors. And I don't. I, I think it's. I think it's hard to fathom how much of an organizational change that was. Whether it was something they realized at the moment was so massive, or it's something they just look back and are like, "Oh my God, we did that." Uh, but when we had um, at, at Comnet DC, we had uh, their VP of Social Media, Rajiv Moody, come talk to us about this, and he just couldn't stress enough the idea of find the places on social media where you can let go of control and back to what Ashley was talking about a moment ago and enter into the conversation. And, and he, he talked about it in this case with, with all these photographers, um, but I think there's a lot of other places that you can take a look at it as well. Let's, they're getting so much amazing data, I, I won't even talk about the data side of this. And, and he did this whole thing about like which photo do you think was the most popular and they've broken down all the attributes. Can you forward one slide? But, but I will note, like, if, like, one of Nithia's black magics is that she can go into any chaotic situation and show you that it was totally planned. Like, when you, when you hear from them on what popular photos are, you're like, oh, my God, you've broken this down. You, you've, you've got me pegged. But, but when he said to let go of control, I felt an entire room of ComNet DC attendees shudder. Like, and, and I appreciate that shudder. I really do. So the lesson I want to take from the Nat Geo case, though, is really to like, look at your pipeline. When we talk about content strategy pipeline, it's always these stages, ideation, creation, editing, production, distribution, measurement. Those might happen in one meeting. Those might happen in successive meetings. Look at that string for your organization and figure out where it's slowing down. And then figure out how can you get creative to make that slowdown move like literally moot. You're not going to overcome it. You're going to make it obsolete. So does that mean that you need a new meeting that you're not having? Does that, mean, uh, does that mean giving up control in one way or another? Does that mean bringing in more participants into your content machine? And I think that's, that's my, the last big question for, you, for any organization is what would make content a team sport? I think at, back at San Diego, uh, we had that CEO keynote for the first time. And I think that, that was like, you know, make, make content a team sport starting at the top. And, and that, that, we're right on with that. But I think when you look at your whole organization, how can you get more people involved in content? And what does that mean? It, it, it means some tough things. It's like culture shift, right? Everyone's a communicator in this new era. It, it is a culture shift. And it, and it means like giving up some of your own special thoughts teaching your colleagues how to be more like you when it comes to communicating. It means explaining more about what you are. One of the things Nat Geo has going for it, it can let out, go of control, because I don't think anybody's unclear on what their brand is or what their mission is. Every single photographer that works for them probably grew up wanting to work for them <laughs> and absolutely knows who they are and what they are about. 
Can you say that about your organization, that everyone down to the interns knows exactly who you are and what you're about, where your landmines are, what your third rails are? That's what lets more people, per that's what will let them particip participate in communications without having to have so much command and control. Um, <clears throat> third lesson here is about knowing what you want and what it takes. I think this definitely touches on goals and process. Um, the example um, that came to mind is uh, Save the Children did a little bit of experimentation on Snapchat back in December as part of the Every Child campaign. Um, there was a, they did a day in the life at the at a Zatari refugee camp and, um, and let me back up before that. Let me just give you a quick overview of Snapchat. Um, Snapchat is a messaging app um, where the messages disappear after like five to ten seconds. Sometimes you can view them twice. Um, Snapchat has evolved in the last year to, to allow users to collect stories. Um, it's fun, it's ephemeral, it's no pressure, it's, a, it's, it's primarily photo and video, so um, you can really get immersive with your photos and it's a lot of fun, you know, it's like painting over photos with your finger and um, it's, a, you know, it's, it, it's a very light, uh, it's light and easy um, for users. Um, they also have 20 million users daily. Um, Facebook tried. Oh, stop. Twenty million people are following Save the Children on Snapchat. No, no, no. no, no. Snapchat, Snapchat users. Snapchat oh, users. Snapchat, Snapchat is twenty million. Uh, so uh, that'd, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be like <laughs> mission accomplished. Wow. <laughs> Sorry drop about that. Good clarification. Um, I think I, the reason I say this is because I think uh, people are excited about Snapchat. Um, they hear a lot about Snapchat, but they don't exactly know why. Um, the reason I think a lot of brands are excited about Snapchat is because it's 20 million users daily. Um, most of them are under 35. Half of them are under 25. Um, and it's an exciting market, and it's an exciting market to um, to think about the potential of as it grows um, and as the product grows. Let's just pause here, just to put this in context. Mm -hmm. Facebook, as one of my good friends has said, has eaten the internet, right? They have up, they crossed the threshold of a billion unique users back in September of last year. Yep. And it's now, what is it, 60? You guys know this, but 60% like of every interaction on a mobile device is on Facebook property. It's WhatsApp, Instagram, or Facebook. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yep. But, it's, but their billion is over a month. They're billions over a month, not every day. Yeah. All right, don't make me do the math. No, <laughs> <laughs> no math. There would be no math. Um, but I think what was what's really exciting about this is is and and I don't want to speak for Save the Children, but I think what was exciting about this to see is they had a they had a campaign, they had a team going um, to a refugee camp, and they were trying to they were trying to bring attention to um, to to a situation and a cause, and they did it in a way um, with no expectation of polish. Um, that allowed them to, to tell the story of where they were on the ground, and I think the roughness of the video, and I think this is where, if you, you, can, you can certainly Google it and, and we can add a link when we distribute the case study, um, it, it feels rough in a way that it wouldn't, feel, it wouldn't feel the same on Facebook when you see it on Snapchat. And I think um, there is something in that um, when you think about what the authentic experience is of, of, of these different channels and, and what you can deliver through it. Um, I think you know Snapchat is certainly an, an, an extreme, and, and I bring it up partly because uh, we've started to hear it with our clients. Should we be on Snapchat? Um, and in the usually in the same paragraph of discussing millennials in, in, a, in, a, in like a draft in a blue sky way. Um, and I think um, it's always important to be on the on the edge of where these things are, to understand what's attractive about them, and to also be able to say, this isn't right for us. I think that this isn't right for us is really important, and I think you can, you can find that um, through your own research, um, by picking up the phone. Um, I think ComNet provides a lot of really great resources to reach out into your community to find out who else is trying these things, what they've learned, why, why it worked for them or didn't, and, and, and roadblocks that you should recognize along the way um, that, that, that maybe you you're not thinking about now, but they know because they've come to the other side of it. So um, I don't know, Sean, if you wanted to add anything there. No, I think that's right. I think whenever you're trying to build anything, the good news is, is you don't have to go it alone, at least with regard to the network, right? Uh, I could do a shameless plug here for what Tristan's building right now, which is a whole new way for members to get together, but well, we, we'll hold that for a little bit later, but we have some exciting stuff to share with you soon. And let me just throw in really quick before you go, because like, there is a cutting room floor for this presentation. and, and 
Um, anybody that's worked with me knows that I like to talk about emotion in work, and I like to make people cry in meetings in a good way, and I like to cry a lot at work. Um, so one thing I'll also say about this here, and I don't know how many people have seen these conversations, but they are happening, and they, they're happening in the commercial community, and they're going to cross over to us really soon, is how to solve the problem of vertical video. And whenever you look at your own usage on your cell phone and, and see how much more intimate and emotional vertical video feels, how much more engaged and involved you are, more like you're on FaceTime than when you turn your phone sideways and watch something that was made by Hollywood. Just, just look at that in your own life and then think about, like, well, what, what would that be in our organization? When, when is our moment to be that emotional and that intimate and that up close with an audience member? Because everything we're doing, that your causes are doing, that your organizations are doing, it's serious emotional stuff. And we may take a step back and talk programmatically and strategically and at high levels and with global statistics. But like, look at things like this from that lens, too. Like, where is, how do we bring the, back the emotion to our work? Sorry, sorry, I wanted to take a tangent. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, questions to ask, I think, how does a channel you know, uniquely delivered to a valued audience. And I think that it's okay to contain this as an experiment. Um, and I think uh, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the next thing that you do forever, but containing an experiment, putting some guardrails on it, talking about what the goals are of the experiment, and then being willing to kind of report out transparently whether or not it worked um, it can go a long way within, within an organization. I mean, also understanding the assets and resources that are gonna be needed for true impact. How are you measuring that impact? How are you talking about it? What about the experiment will let you know um, if you're on the right track to, to realizing that? So um, I think, you know, for us, we've talked a little bit about how we've evaluated this already, but I think when we, when we took a step back, the questions to ask brought us, um, brought us to this. And one thing I just want to add here, I, I really encourage people to take the, have the guts to be able to sunset a social network or a project that isn't working for you. If you still have a Google Plus page and you never update it, you should really evaluate your strategy there. Um, same thing with Twitter. It's much better and more useful for your audiences to redirect them to live networks or places where they can find real and accurate and updated information or better experiences than to continue to let them sort of linger on these pages that are no longer updated. So have the guts to say, we're shutting it down, it was a pilot or it was something that worked for us then and no longer works for us now. Well, the strategy is oftentimes saying no. Absolutely. I'm going to skip ahead to questions because um, you'll have the you'll have the deck at the end and and um, we want to make sure that there's All right. time for that. Let me let me jump into a few. I'm going to start here with the questions you guys are typing into the chat box and, and I know there's a number of you, uh, Wilda and others, who are really active on Twitter. So thank you. I'll try to get to those as well. Uh, Todd asks. Uh, coming up with innovative content strategy is one thing, but how do you convince a colleague to move away from outdated strategies that they cling to for the sake of familiarity? So let me throw a really outrageous idea, direct mailing. Direct mail really works. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't convince them away from things that work. Call at dinner, too. I love that. Um, does anybody want to take this first? I found that for me, it's data. If I can show data that something isn't working or something is working, pilot an idea, start with something small, show incremental change, and that gets buy-in for ideas. Yeah. I'm such a bright spot strategy person. Like, <laughs> just go to the people near them that want to do things you think are going to work better then measure both back to Ashley's and then say, hey, do you keep on wanting to do that outdated thing? I mean, everybody at your organization, hopefully, cares about the mission and wants to be effective. So measure what's working and show it. Well, and if about measurement real quick. Yes. Because I think for like the example of the San Francisco Bar Twitter account, one of the things yes. I saw in the little screenshot was it got retweeted like crazy and liked like crazy. In my mind, that's great, but that ain't impact. Right. So let's talk a little bit about how you actually can set measurement or measurable goals that kind of translate across different platforms. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have to, we're all about the teamwork and you're going to have to get close to the programmatic side of the house on these things, right? You, you really need to know what they're trying to accomplish in a shorter term kind of way, in like a one year and a five year way and work with them to back that out. So what, if I was Bart and I saw all those retweets, the next thing's going to be a pretty expensive sentiment survey to see what the difference was. And as an organization, 
Like, it's already hard enough to decide to take some money away from a program and spend it on some communications. This is that next layer. Like, measurement is, can be very expensive, and you have to decide what measures matter to you and work collaboratively, collaboratively to say, you know what, that's enough. That, that chart that Nithya showed about social media usage, that was from 2014. But you know what? I don't have the money to go, I don't have a, a million dollars to give to McKenzie to go get me like this month's version of that. So that has to be good enough for us for now and we need to move forward. I think, I mean, and I think just to add on to the letting go of outdated things, I think there's a forward data piece of that, which is how is the work we're doing performing, but then also what did it cost us yeah. Yeah. to get here? Time, the salaries of the people involved, if you have to break it down into like a per hour of somebody that is a salaried employee for a year, to be like this thing costs way more for the impact that it had, and we could have done four other things in that amount of time. You know, things that I think sometimes uh, people feel are too hard to do, if you actually, again, going back to the process, if you break down what's required, it's not necessarily as much of a lift. Um, you have an opportunity for different kinds of distribution, and, the, and you'll find that it might be more cost effective. And I think, too, it's getting back to that good old conversion funnel understanding where something like social media, for example, fits into that conversion funnel. And it may just be getting people in the door. It may not be a hard line data that has reached a conversion point at that, at that very moment, but it's understanding that it's getting people in the door. I think I, I read recently that something like 30% of people make a decision to donate based on something they've seen on social media, and that's not a, that's not a small number. So pay attention to where these activities fall into your conversion funnel and what they're leveling up to next. So uh, Wilda has a question on Twitter. If you all are on Twitter, uh, there's a good conversation happening. Follow the hashtag at ComNetLive. Her question is, uh, what if our org's work isn't always very visual, but we're desperately trying to reach young people who, and I'm going to interpret this for Wilda, are very visual and like to see stuff on the web that comes with pictures and videos and, and the occasional chip. Am I pronouncing that right? Or gif? Oh, oh. Dude, we can settle this right now. Is it gif or gif? Gif. 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 Damn it. All right. Well, I'm showing my age. It's okay. Oh, Jeff is fine. Jeff. Kristen is, is offering uh, a different interpretation. He lives on Reddit. What is it? I've heard that the inventor of the GIF calls it GIF, so I go with GIF. Yeah, yeah I'm a peanut butter popular culture calls it GIF. <laughs> Inventors are worth it. <laughs> um, uh, I think a good thing here is to consider, to answer your question, I think a thought to consider, maybe your uh, day-to-day -day is not very visual, but maybe your outcomes are. Great infographics go a long way as well. So take some piece of data that you might have and figure out a way to translate that visually. Yeah, and, and remember, like... By the way, infographics aren't pie charts, right? No. No. <laughs> no. If, if you saved four whales, go get four whales out of wingdings and stack them up and make them look like a bar chart, and now you've got a visualization. That's great. It's awesome. Um, also remember like all the great ideas and the great work of your organization is done by people <laughs> and people want to connect with people. So like they have faces, you know, and they maybe even have faces in candid situations where they're being actually human. So like I think those, those visuals are available to you. I think that kind of reality of your organization can be powerful. All right, let's go to uh, another question. There's actually a, sort of a trend here. Julie, Mark, and Jill are all kind of teasing around the same question, which is uh, how do you reduce, this is Mark's question, how do you reduce some of the friction involved in content creation so the con colleagues don't see it as an additional burden? Let me just read out the other ones here. So Jill's question is how do we get people thinking about communications and content strategy way upstream? When the products are being created, this is the this is the sticky wicket for almost everybody, right? The thing is done, and you bring it to comms and say, now put it in the front page of the New York Times, or make it go viral, or God knows what the other outcomes people are looking for. How do you do that? Yeah. Do you have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> I can go for the first one first. That's the easier one. Um, you know, you, you got to bring uh, you got to bring your colleagues into understanding what's going on from a communication standpoint, so they understand the value of this to their work. Because once again, they work at Earth Justice or the World Wildlife Fund or uh, EDF because they are trying to accomplish a mission. You don't accidentally end up being the head of a program at one of these organizations, like because you were in the right room at the right time. It's, you actually care about the mission. And, and the tough job is then for you as the communicator to, to bring them into understanding how this is part of that equation 
for what we did uh, at, at a, a very old and well-established think tank um, to, get, to get more content contribution out of the staff was to bring them onto social media at a time when uh, the organization didn't know if they should be on Twitter. We put together a training deck to show uh, a group of scholars how at a half hour a day or an hour a day they could start getting involved in Twitter. It sounds almost like for the price of a cup of coffee. You can, <laughs> and, and in doing so, well, the great thing about social media is it's a two-way platform. So they, that, they like unknowingly were thrust into a world of speaking and listening. And that just, that, that just, I think that really brought content home for them uh, and helped to make a much more collaborative pool. And then you just kind of graduate them up. From it does really require, in many cases, a culture shift, right? Oh. Or an intentional, as you're building something, building the culture piece at the start. Really I'll, getting people to understand that piece. And, and I also think, like, before it becomes the way that we're going to do things forever and always, it can be a content experiment with a friendly face and it can be one person. And again, it, you know, it's saying, hey, you're on the programmatic side. I think like we want to help you. We want to try this. We know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of new thinking in the way that we work together. Um, and we want to understand where the pressure points are. And we'd like to use this as a test case um, to put something together. Here's our thought for the end of this. Here's how we'd like to try and promote it. We think that by working together from the beginning, this can just be a stronger effort. And, and, and it's almost kind of like declaring it as a content experiment within the organization um, with the idea of thinking about how you're, instead of thinking like this is going to be everyone, you're like, first we're going to try it with one, one program and one person in, in, in that department. Now, next we're going to try it with three people. If the one thing succeeds, it'll be, we're going to add two more. Um, and, and think about scaling that way over a period of time rather than making it the new thing. Because you also, as the communications department, you don't want suddenly an influx of content that you have to figure out how to make sense of. Some of it will be great, some of it won't, won't be right, and you're stuck learning how to figure out how to say no to people, which is a good problem to have, but not always a great problem to have either. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I really go back to sort of that pacing yourself in understanding what you're asking for. Yep. Um, and, and what's going to make the most sense? Because by the time, you know, once you move one, one person to three, you'll know, you know, asking for photos when someone goes on a two-day trip is hard. You know, you'll, and you'll, you'll be able to prepare for things like that and, and, and make the ask more sophisticated. Getting up stream real quick. Oh, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say this will be our last question, then we're going to go back into the presentation. Yep. We'll have more time for everybody else's questions. At the yep. End. Yeah, and there's not much presentation left anyway. We kind of front-loaded some of this. Uh, getting upstream is so hard. Um, strategy one is, man, you are so lucky if you have someone with a communications or advertising background on your board. <laughs> that person's going to be your friend, and 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 you want them to stay at a board meeting, talk about how modern product design works, how you know re modern research design should be like modern product design, where it's like we identified a need and we're going to deliver to it. How often do we just research something then at the end say? Who do we want to give this research to? So that, that's one great thing. And the second great thing is, is br the bright spot strategy. If you can forgive yourself when someone comes to you on the last day and says, now get it on the New York Times, if you can forgive yourself the honest truth that you could have done better on this and just do your best, do that and go find the person that's willing to talk to you earlier in the conversation. Again, it's not about doing it with everybody in the organization. Do it with one person and then tell that story about how you sat at the beginning of the research's formation and how a decision was made that was calm driven that made the research more impactful. Look out for those. I call this the drug dealer strategy. <laughs> you just have to get one person hooked. Absolutely. Well, what we talk about, you know, in, in our, in our you know, Pulitzer Award winning blurb for this um, webinar, we, we talked about um, the fact that content strategy is local. And that's what the bright spot strategy is. You're making a case study within your building. You're disarming anybody's ability to say, but that was this brand, or this was that content, or that was that news item. You're going to disarm that by doing great work with one colleague and then telling that story. And those will become your best evangelists. Program people or policy folks or whomever they may be, field workers who see the light, will be the folks that folks will come up to and say, how did you get that? And when they tell them, the comms team helped me, you will find new friends fairly yeah. quickly. That's been my experience anyway Absolutely. in other lives. Let's move on to, to the next slide if we can. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Um, 
this lesson's funny. Uh, be ready to be successful. Let's jump to the next. Um, this is about nimbleness. This is about being, uh, you know, what, what shape you are in as an organization. Um, we, um, we are very fortunate at 3Spot to work with a lot of great organizations. And, um, and I remember when the Oliver Show started, we were keeping a score on uh, how many episodes had our clients in it. And I think at the first three or the first five or the first six, our clients kept on showing up in the show. And of course, you know, John Oliver is really just like the proliferation of The Daily Show and what that's done for our space. But if you flip forward a little, um, you know, these, these are opportunities where, where somebody like HBO or, the, or Comedy Central or somebody else has spent more money than you have a year um, in making 20 minutes of storytelling about your issue. And maybe they didn't get everything right and maybe it's not the tone of your organization, but just saying, hey, yeah, did you see that thing? It was on our issue. Like th that last one I just put, put up, he, he spent 20 minutes on standardized testing. Like that's amazing. And there's an organization out there that's been, Good. Yeah, that's been struggling to get people to care about the issue. And he like, you know, he, his team two months before the show was like, let's do standardized testing. And then they did it and they brought their talent to bear. But the question is, like, are you, are you sharing internally when these things happen? I can't tell you how many times I walk into an organization on a Thursday and say, hey, did you hear on StoryCorps? It was your issue. That, that StoryCorps, it was, it was one of the people with the disease you work on. Did you hear that? And everybody I sat here says no. And I'm, I usually assume by the fifth person, the fifth person would say, yeah, the first person talked to you this morning and they told me about it. Like, in your organization, are you internally communicating when your issue is coming up in a way that's fluid and you're able to t tackle? The next thing is, oh. I, I also think, I hope that, you know, if you're listening to this, that you already have a crisis plan in place. You know how your organization will react when something bad goes down. But I sure hope that you have an opportunity plan in place as well in case Beyonce decides tomorrow that your cause is her thing. Um, so come up with an <laughs> opportunity plan and how you'll, uh, how you'll actually get together and use this as an opportunity for your organization. Yeah. I also think that, I think the idea of, of content curation is an interesting way to test the waters with both your audience and, and, and maybe internal stakeholders that feel nervous about pushing on the edges of your brand with humor or edginess. Um, but it, it's a way for you to connect with your audience and, and show that you are aware of things that are happening out there, um, that you're, you're on the pulse of pop culture um, in a case like John Oliver, um, and, that, and, if, and maybe that you have a sense of humor. I mean, if that's something that you're looking to evolve, you know, I think that, and, and I think that curation is a really easy way to do that internally, whether you're doing it through an email newsletter, whether you're doing it um, in social channels, whether it's part of, you know, your blog strategy to, to bring attention to, to some of those things and to say, you know, hey, we don't usually talk about, talk this personally about our issue, but we tried it. and there was more reaction to it than anything we posted in the last year, um, maybe this is an opportunity for investment. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a, I think a, a, a way to get your, get your feet wet in the, in the shallow end um, before making it something bigger that's, that's more of a lift on you. I'm going to come back to that last question here, but I just I wanted to show that, no, this is perfect. And so this, this and I, I want to put this up because like now we have the spectrum of things that happened. The Sikh Coalition actually worked directly with The Daily Show to do a segment, and then they're promoting it here, right? Or here's Pew uh, speaking to the State of the Union address. Now, we all know when the State of the Union address is going to happen next year and the year after and the year after. It's a well-scheduled event. I put these up there to show that, like, you know, reacting to John Oliver is the same as reacting to the State of the Union address. You just have a little less time to do it, you know? But... Uh, then again, it's a lot less cluttered. Whatever your State of the Union package is, get to work early because everyone's trying to get it, right? But it doesn't like, just have to be social media, yeah, right? Absolutely not. Yeah, it's not just social media. It, it, it could be, and it doesn't even need to be digital media. It could be an event you're having in response to it. It could be any kind of thing. I think the, the example I want that, that I wanted that I, I, I couldn't dig up in time was, was that one you were pointing out about after the formation um, Super Bowl event and, and organizations started curating numerous voices that were speaking about in response to whether Beyonce was being political or not and that whole conversation that was going on, they, they started scooping those up into curated blog posts 
and curated newsletters and curated pieces of content. Not saying, that's my voice, that's my voice, that's my voice, but instead saying, this is a conversation that matters and there's a lot of voices and here, come check it out. Another good one, just Google this, is um, ARP's Oscar coverage. They yeah. plan weeks in advance for this event and they're, they're ready to be able to be responsive based on who wins the award. And they're sending people back to their site with great stories, interviews that they've had with these folks. It really is a multi-channel event for them and it's, it's hugely successful. So definitely check out that case study too. The last question to ask yourself on all these things though, and we've all had tastes of mainstream media like shining its little light on us for a moment and, and our traffic literally exponentiates in a day, right? That we suddenly got a quarter of a million visitors in four hours because BuzzFeed did something or, or what have you. In these moments, it is so important to remember what your goals are because odds are maybe that quarter million people just really doesn't matter to you. And you want to you want to help the personalities and the egos and the individuals of your organization always remember what actually matters and where the goals are, so that you don't get blinded by the light of these moments of the Daily Show or 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 whatever. Uh, it could be stumble upon suddenly sending you 50,000 people that don't matter. Um, so do always remember your goals when you're when you're taking a look. Uh, are we going back to questions? Are we all done yet? Did we have like we have some informal ones we can go, but I think you have a lot of questions. We do have a lot of questions. So Kira's got a great one. Can you share some examples? Uh, and I'm, we're not going to do this with slides, but can you share some examples of how organizations successfully document content strategy? So I think Kira's asking, can, how do you tell me how to write it down? Where do I start? You know, if I was drawing the alphabet, I'd start with A, and I end up at Z. How do I plot this out on paper or on my laptop? So Jamie mentioned earlier that Nithya has this incredible chart that talks about the content strategy process. And it really, that should be your template. Uh, understanding who are the people that are involved with the ideation of, a, of an idea, the review and the approval of that idea, the editing and the, um, the production of that idea. And so understanding what that process looks like for your organization to go from having a content idea to having it be out there um, and shared with your community and measuring its impact. Understanding what each of those moments are, the people that are involved in it, and your goals attached to each of those phases too. And, and at a higher level, if your organization makes annual communications plans or marketing plans or anything that is like a strategy document, at the higher level it looks exactly like that. All con content strategy is just like everything else. It just tends to not name a channel in it because that's, that's part of the arsenal. Instead of saying this is our plan for placing five op-eds by the end of the year, it's, it's, it's a little more amorphous than that because you don't really know always where the content is going to land at the end of the day. Document the, all of the tools and your, your network that are available to you to share content, to share ideas. So maybe it starts with your website, but you have these social networks and you have an email strategy and you probably have a live events and a direct mail strategy. And so really start to map out your network of, of content options and understand how those work together and make sure that other people understand how those work together and what their strengths are. Um, one of the biggest things that I often hear is that a development or fundraising team will come to the communications team and say, hey, put this thing on Facebook when really they're trying to meet, meet an audience with that information that isn't on Facebook or maybe isn't on Twitter. And so helping other people to understand what, how and why these tools are going to work best for them I think is something that you can do to get that content strategy internalized. I think, I think it's like a, a thing with content strategy attention in, in, in defining it for an organization that I always wrestle with is the idea of putting something in a PDF that no one is ever going to open again. Um, and so I think it's really, I think it's important to document it and define it in, in, the, in the ways that, um, that, that Jamie talked about at a high level, you know, annually, company-wide. I think, I think a nice extension of it is, is to, to bring it to like three to five goals that you're going to accomplish through content in the coming year, and then to make that a recurring part of a communications meeting or an editorial meeting, um, and really really make sure that content strategy is getting, a, getting regular love and care from you, um, alongside opportunities to, to be sharing and discussing landscape opportunities, new channels, what they might mean for your organization in line with those three to five goals. I think, I think, it's, really, I, I think it's really important not to 
define content strategy and then walk it away. I think it's a living, breathing thing for your organization, your content is, and so um, those goals should become a structured part of the way you talk about your organization um, in, in both action and, and aspiration. Let's talk about PDS for a minute because Wilda and Emily are both giving you a lot of love on Twitter about this. Let's be really clear. I think most folks in the audience have probably seen the World Bank report where something like 6% of the PDFs they produce were ever downloaded more than twice. That includes the author's mom. Yeah. Like, you may have seen, we did a series last year at the network called The PDF is the Enemy. Uh, and for a whole host of reasons, if you are producing stuff in PDF, let me just take a leap here and say that ain't a content strategy. So one of my favorite um, things that we have done recently is we worked with one of our organizations to develop a weekly email, uh, just an outlook, it's not a super formal email, uh, and it's basically highlights from the week around the web. So they talk about uh, high-profile high news events that happened within their community, they share some of the new content that went on their site over the course of that week, and then they also share things that received reactions from their community across social media. So this is part original content that they're sharing with their wider organization, but it's also part user-generated content that they're sharing so that people actually have a true sense around the organization about what their community is saying and what they think. And I think that that's really helped to dispel a lot of myths about some of the old, tired um, ideas that they had about how people think about this particular organization or interact with that organization. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's one of my, my black magic secrets. Like, I only work in Google Docs now, and I only share edit links. So anybody that ever sees any document I ever do now can utterly change it. Um, so I think that's kind of the anti-PDF. We're going to drive ourselves, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I think I've watched over the last two years how much that has changed the way I think and how much that has changed the way I work. Um, when it comes to that content strategy, when you find the document that works for your organization, make sure you're not the only one that can change it. Um, uh, it'll, it'll, really, it'll really change things up for you. And do change it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask a very obvious question. Allison has this. It's been on my mind. What's the difference between digital strategy and content strategy? Well, in this room, none. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the whole answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, content strategy is broader. I mean, your events are part of your content strategy, right? Um, yep. Your pieces of paper are part of your content strategy. Your TV appearances are part of your content strategy. There's, there's not a huge difference. Um, it's just a matter of whether, it's honestly, one, it depends on what your team is. One of the secrets about content strategy is you don't have to redesign your website to change your content strategy, right? Those aren't part and parcel. So like if you don't have a redesign budget for a website or if you can't build some microsite for a campaign, you can still do a content strategy. You've got plenty of channels. Uh, digital strategy to me usually starts talking pretty intimately about what the technology is and what technology we should use and what it can do for us. So they're just different parts of a Venn diagram. Yeah, I, and I, I, brought, I brought this um, user expectations are always evolving uh, slide up again because I think that um, there are a lot of gray areas. I think there used to be a time that you uh, published a story and then you distributed it, you know, and like, and, and that's like the olden days. Um, and someone tossed the newspaper onto your front porch, you know, like, and then that's so just to put a stamp on what time period I'm talking about. And then I think, you know, you had a website and you distributed your website through social channels and, and through other, you know, email and things like that. Um, and I think where where the industry beyond just you know nonprofits and foundations and the types of clients that we work for is moving, and, and so I think everyone is moving there, is into a place where your your digital content strategy and your social strategy are going to be very fluid and very connected, and there are a lot of opportunities to use social vehicles to tell original stories in ways that a website could never do a newspaper could never do, a, a television spot could never do. And so I think what we're trying to do, and, and, and the reason that we use so many social examples through this is that we think that there's a real opportunity to use social to help you break the mold on the way that you're thinking about content and what you're investing in. 
Um, it's not because everyone on this call should go get a Snapchat account for, for your company, but it's, it's because it allows you to, to wonder what your organization's story would look like in that medium um, and to really to, to experiment and, and to push the boundaries. And so I think in doing that, sometimes that helps you understand what you should be doing in the traditional vehicles better. Yeah. Great. I think that's all the time we have questions for. Guys, thanks so much. Uh, this has been amazing. I've learned a lot. Uh, three Spot is, you can follow them on Twitter, oh, yeah. which can be part of your education strategy uh, at Three Spot. Uh, they're also on the web, and, and you can find them lots of other places. And I think we're going to see you all in Detroit. Uh, before I get to Detroit, I do want to show something to you guys. This is kind of exciting. This is Change Agent. It's the journal that the network's been producing now for a little over a year. Uh, and the new issue is going to be focusing on risk. Risk means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and so we're going to tackle it in a few different ways. But this issue is being made by 3Spot, and so there's some really, really cool stuff in there, including a bunch of 3Spot inspired and made tools to help you play with your content strategy and your social media plan and lots of other things. Really, really cool stuff. So look for that. It's going to be in your mailbox in about a month's time, thereabouts. Depends how fast the printer can work. And you're only getting that if you're a member. I'm assuming all of you are actually good members and good standing and all that good stuff. Let me tell you a couple other things. The conference is happening uh, in September. You can see the dates. Oh, that's not the conference. That's the case for communications. The conference is happening. Here we go. September 20th through the 30th will be in Detroit. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I wish I could tell you who we have lined up, but suffice to say that news will be shared soon. Registration opens up on the 1st. We had over 110 people send in ideas for breakout sessions, so it's going to be a really big honor to be one of the final 12 that gets, uh, gets picked. But thanks to everybody who sent over some information. And then the final shameless plug I'm going to do is for this. This is the series of case studies that we've been doing and will continue to do with our friends over at Stanford Social Innovation Review. You've heard from the Skoll Foundation, from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. You're going to be hearing next week from Natural Resources Defense Council. Later on, we'll hear from the Clinton Foundation, from Surfrider, the Heinz Endowments, 350.org, lots of other folks. Uh, it's amazing, and hopefully these will be uh, uh, not only tell you what happened, but how it happened and the impact that it had, which I think we're all really excited to see, and will hopefully help you make the case for that board member, that CEO, that sticky wicket in your organization. It just doesn't quite get why communications is so damn crucial. Uh, finally, uh, Tristan and I are going to send you a survey uh, that we will share with our good friends at 3Spot about how much you enjoyed this amazing hour of your life. Uh, so please say nice things. Give us some good feedback if you would. Uh, you can answer some questions. Uh, you can also reply with some feedback, some open-ended questions there. That will be in your inbox shortly along with the deck, and we will be posting, as is always our habit, within the next week or two, we will post this webinar in its entirety up on ComNetwork. Dot org. So thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you being with us. Be good, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, all. Thanks.